Renee, would you please tell us your full name? Renee F. Calendar. What did BF stand for? Fox. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? I was bo born in Poland, a small town the name of Kozienice, in 1922. Where is that near? It's about 90 kilometers from Warsaw. Mm -hmm. What was your life like in your little town before the war, in growing up? Growing up? I had a good childhood. I was never a teenager. Um, I had two other brothers, and my mother's family lived in the same town. I was the gr oldest grandchild on both sides and spoiled rotten. <laughs> <laughs> and what did your father do? My father was a certified public accountant, and he worked in a bank. It was one bank in town, and that's where he was. What was it like going to school in that town? I didn't know any better, <laughs> and now I see the difference. And the, the school, seven, six days a week. Mm -hmm. Saturday, I didn't go, but I had to make up my work Saturday. Um, as a child, it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened when the war broke out? End of schooling, end of everything. The truest, we had to move um, from our apartment to, we lived with our grandparents, because that their house was in the part where the ghetto was going to be formed at the time. And the uh, apartments were very Was the ghetto going to be formed in that town? In the, in the, yes, in the town. Mm -hmm. They brought a lot of people from s smaller towns all around, so apartments were impossible to get. But we were lucky, like I said, we stayed with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And lived from day to day. There was no jobs, nobody mm -hmm. could work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Food was scarce. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people that came to town were very poor. There was no, there wasn't a time that you sat to eat, sat down to dinner or anything. That mm -hmm. there was always somebody at the door, crying. And children were the first victims. Renee, what was the, before the ghetto? Uh, was your what kind of a Jewish life did you have there? And was there any anti-Semitism that you were aware of at that time in growing up? It was anti and Poland always had anti-Semitism. But, but did you experience any as a child? A little bit in school. In school, you were really at the mercy of the teacher because did the you grading go to system. Did you with everybody? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The grading system the teacher gave you, it wasn't like here that if you do two or three wrongs, it's deducted. And if the teacher liked you, you did okay. Mm -hmm. My teacher happened to like me. I spoke good Polish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was happy in school. Yeah. Did I you had have Christian friends? Yeah, I, have, mm, I had Christian friends. Mostly not, but uh, I had a lot of, a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. We're not close friends, but we played with them. Uh, All right, continue with what happened when the war broke out. Well, in September 19, September 1st, 1939, the day of my birthday, it started. We really didn't think that it's going to be as bad as it was, because there were a lot of German Jews came in from Germany when they sent them out of Germany a year earlier, and they were telling stories, and we didn't believe it. We said, well, they were, they were rich Jews, and it took away. And, but what does he want with somebody? Polish Jews were not considered by German poor, very poor. We were not rich. We were middle class. So what are they going to do with us? They're not going to hurt us. Little did we know. And what did they do with you? 
the first thing they used to come to the there was a call in Germany, Judenrat, which means a, a committee, a Jewish committee. And they told the committee what they want, the Germans. The SS came. He said, but in 10 days, I need so many, so many thousands of slotters, which is like an American dollar. That's the money. Uh, then they picked up young, first they started with young men picked him up on the streets and took him to work for labor. Then the, we had to go to work. We worked, first we went in the morning, they picked us up in the morning and brought us back at night. Now were you still living in your house or were you? In my grandparents' house. I see. And then we stayed there, they closed the ghetto and there was like a curfew, you couldn't get out. From the ghetto, you couldn't get out, period. But um, f even in the ghetto, it was a curfew. About how many people were in the ghetto, do you know? I really don't know. It was a small town. But as small as the town was, they brought in from, small, from smaller little towns and people into the ghetto in Charles. In because I see Charles, because it's my home now. I lived there most of my life. And um, then one day, they arrested a few young people, which they call intelligentsia. And uh, it came back to us. Somebody sent a note and said that they asked them about my father, and my father should get out of town because they're going to arrest him. So my father and I went to Warsaw. My mother's sister lived in Warsaw. At the time, she still lived in her own apartment. But uh, they gave us, I think, a month, no, about three weeks, to get out of the apartment because they're going to form a ghetto, too. We went out with my aunt one afternoon, and they rented a house in the section that the ghetto was going to be. And we came back and couldn't get back in the house. So we just, whatever we had on, that was ours, and that was it. Now, was your mother and your brothers with no, you? That, no, my mother and my brothers stayed at home. I, only I went with my father. And. Um, we had to move to the ghetto, in the Warsaw ghetto. But the Warsaw ghetto wasn't, at the time, it wasn't closed yet. In other words, you could go in and out by 7 o'clock, I don't remember at the time, you had to be back. Then they said, I think it was November, I don't remember, they said they're going to close the Warsaw ghetto. So my father and I came back home. We stayed with the rest of the family till 41. Living conditions, I, I won't say we starved, but whatever we had, we sold. And um, we lived. What did you actually do in the ghetto? Did you work? Nothing. Uh, there was a committee um, committee formed to help the poor. I was the rich. Uh, the poor and the poor children. The parents couldn't feed them. The translation of the of the organization was drop of milk. And we used to make where every day. It was a, a crowd of us, I don't know, I'm good, twice a day. We went to the office and we mixed formulas and gave it to the poor children. And uh, it, it wasn't enough. The children were eating from the trash. If you see it now in the picture, it sounds horrible, but it's true. They were eating the peelings, potato peelings onion peelings, anything they could get put How in. How did you get food in the ghetto? 
You know, I thought about it. I don't remember. You know, we used to, in the fall, usually every year, we used to buy enough potatoes to last you for the year and put it in cellars, vegetables, and things like this. And that's what you live then. Where did you get money to buy the food? Well, the food at the time, we had... Uh, we had already bought, it was before September. See, the war started in September. So we had some food, bread or something we sold. My mother had a, my, dad had, my father had a golden watch, so he sold the golden watch. He had a, a piece of silver, so he sold the silver. Polish, Polish people bought it. How long did you stay in that ghetto? Ten. I think it must have been September or October, 41. And then what happened in 41? I went, they took us to camp. First, they took us to the same camp that I worked digging ditches. They took the whole families. So my, my brother was born and it was about four, five years old. We left them with a Polish family. And um, for every day, we gave them one day a piece of silver, one day a piece of jewelry, one different things what we have at, had at home. And uh, then we went to work. The men worked one way in one place, and the women in the other one. And um, one afternoon, we came back. And all the men were taken away to a camp somewhere. Um, my, it was my brother and my father were taken away. And my younger brother was already with us in the camp because the lady told us that he wouldn't eat and he's going to die if we don't take him. So we took him and he was with us in the camp. Luckily, he was with my mother. My mother wasn't working yet. She was just in the camp. And uh, my father hid him in the fields. And the child and another child, two children, came back at night. They walked, walked, and they find they found their place and came back. And how long were you in that camp? Just a few months. And from then, they took us to uh, to Skarzysko, which was a, a camp that worked the uh, ammunition factory. And um, I finally got a job that it took me. I could have made the bullet that I killed my father with. I was working in a munition factory, and my mother stayed in the barracks and cleaned the barracks. That's the only way she could survive. She couldn't work in the factory. And how long were you in that camp? I think it must have been 43. When the Russians started pushing from the other side and started coming into Poland, they moved us. And they took us to Częstochowa. They transferred the whole factory to Częstochowa. And uh, I was there till liberation, January 45. Can you tell me a little about what life was like in the camp? I don't know where to start. You had to look presentable. At the time, we didn't have any clothes except what we wore. But you had to have be your hair combed. You had to put a little bit lipstick on. Because if you didn't look good, if you looked bad, you, were, you, you looked tired, that was the end of you. In the morning, when you came out and they kept counting how many people, how many people, and look at your face, and if you didn't look good, out you go. And there was a, a big, uh, behind the barracks, 
there was a, there were a lot of trees there. I remember, I used, to, used to hear a lot of guns going off, and we never saw them again. How did now, you get when when you went to work, you had to look good, right? But if you looked a little bit too good, there was a German whom I liked you, and he called you out. And that was the other end of it, because there's such a thing as Russian Schande, which means you don't mix, mix German race with the Jewish race. So once you were mixed, that was the end of you. You say you had to look good. How did you get clothes and lipstick in the camps? I worked in a factory that was very precision work. I had to wear white gloves to do it. And I had to measure the thing that I was making with a certain instruments. And that instrument, you had to put crayon on to see how it fits, if it rubs or it doesn't rub off. So the gloves were made to socks, because they changed the gloves every day. I made a little color out of the gloves. I comb my hair and put the, put the crayon in my, in my, for, instead of lipstick. And your mother stayed? My mother cleaned the barracks. So she had an extra plate of soup, extra can of soup. What so did your she brother, saved me some. What did your brother do at this time? He was with her in the barracks. That's the only way she could save him. He couldn't have been out any other way. How old was he at that time? Um, he was born in 35, about 60, 70, no, about 70. They made him, they sent him with different messages here and there. There were two little boys. And they survived, I don't know how. I, I, I keep a lot, I think about it a lot. I don't know. What happened to your father and your other brother? They were in the, that other camp and they picked him up. And one day, they were picking up people, like every tenth person or so. They picked up my father and they picked up my brother. And then they were picked up, I think, about 150 people. And they uh, took a machine gun and just sprayed it like that and told the people to bury them. When they picked my father's body up, my brother was underneath them. I don't know if he fainted. I don't know if my father pushed him and fell on top of him, but he was alive. And he was in that camp for till the end. And somebody was telling me when the Germans were pushing, they took the people with them. But some of them were so weak that if you couldn't keep up, that was it, they showed him. It was somebody who said that he saw him two days before the li they were li liberated. So he did not survive? He did not survive. Now, did your mother and brother survive? No, my mother died uh, November 44. I was liberated son, January 45. Just a few months before? Just a few months before. But your brother survived. My brother survived. Don't you have a picture of him? Yes, I do. Here he was about 11 years old. Mm -hmm. That was when, that was at the end of the war? That was at the end of the war. What do you remember about the liberation? It was very sad. Um, the whole day, 
there were bombs falling. The Americans were bombing. And um, the Germans opened up the hospitals. They let everybody out. They opened up the magazines that they have food in the Geva. And they said, we're all going. And I knew that if I go and take my brother, they'll take him right away, back away from me. So I dressed him like a girl. I hit him during the day, and then we went to the barracks. And the police, they had a lot of Jewish policemen, too. They had a lot of Jews do the dirty work for them, too. The policemen came in, and I kept saying um, in German, get out, get out. And then in Polish said, don't move stay. And uh, I, I, I knew they're going to kill us, or they're going to kill us here, they're going to kill us there. We didn't know where they're going, and they're going to take Michael away from me. So I said, well, I'm not going anyway. I sat. I sat in the barracks for a few hours. It was very quiet, and then all of a sudden, the Jewish police came in with guns. Before, they didn't have any guns. And he said, they're all gone. So we came out of the barracks. <laughs> we were so trained to go, so trained to be pushed around, that we went and f ate, a row of aids, and we went and we went. And we come to the end of the camp, and there's a German there. He says, where are you going? I said, I don't, we don't know. We look around, there was no, no Germans with us. We were going by ourselves. And he, he got up and he ran away. So then right after the barracks there, there was a colony where the Germans lived. We went up there, there was dinner on the table, and nobody there. They ran. And then next day, we didn't see anybody. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know what to do. Polish mil uh, militia came in and he said, get out of here because they might have uh, set off, they're going to probably put bombs or something to destroy the camp. So we went out and there was nowhere to go. No friendly soul, no friendly Poles, nobody. We got in an empty house. The house was bombed while we were there. We went out and it was getting cold. We passed by with so big under trace ra on the railroad trains with a lot of meat and we took a blanket because we were cold. <laughs> we had nothing else. When and you say we are you talking about you and your brother? Yes, and there were uh, and, and about a few other people from camp. And uh, we found an empty house, and we stayed there for a few days. We didn't see any Russians or anybody. The Russians came in next day. And uh, we stayed there for a couple of weeks. And then we went home, because we said, par my parents and my grandparents used to say that after World War I, people couldn't find each other for such a long time. If anybody survives, come home. So I got, we went home. How did you get home? That's another story. We went on a train, on, on a cattle train, but I was used to that because that's the way they were transporting us from one camp and the other. But you didn't have to pay? You just got on? There was no pain then. That was, that was right after the war. There were Russian transports and other stuff going. So, and it was cold and snowing and freezing. And we came home, we said, why did we survive? There's nothing to come home, there's nobody. There's no food, there's nothing, no, where to live. Finally, we got in to the house that uh, we used to live, my parents used to live. And we moved in into the kitchen, because it was one room, and it was, we could warm. I went to the old house, 
and tore off some boards so I could heat this out. And uh, we stayed there for... The house was empty? Th yeah, this house was empty because the Germans were using it for our office. So we just used the kitchen to keep warm. Then, just a few months, la a few weeks later, the story started all over again. Started ki too many Jews back. They started killing Jews in the small town. Who started? Some Polak. Some in a little town not far where we, where we were. There were people who I was in camp with. Two sisters survived and then got killed. So somebody said, we have to go. Oh, by that time, you already got some food because uh, the United Jewish Appeal was uh, helping in sending some food for us. We had no clothes. We had. It wasn't easy. Whoever found something that was hidden at home shared it with somebody. I f all of everything we had, I found a few pictures. Everything else was taken. And um, so we went to, let, let's go to a bigger city. So a friend of ours had somebody who lived in Lodge. So we went there. And uh, I was an uh, American. I think it was American zone. No, that was later. Excuse me. That was Paul. That was Russian. And Russian started. The Russians started to put everybody to work. We stayed in Lodge for a few months, and then we decided we're going to go. We're going to go back to Germany because they had displaced person camp. Persons camp. We didn't have anybody. We didn't have nothing to eat. To live there was unbearable. To begin, a every corner, every place you went reminded you some for somebody. And my bro little brother said to me one time, it's just as bad here as it's in camp. The only thing it went that you didn't have to work. And. Um, We hitchhiked. We came to Lodge. Then some other friends came and they, from Lodge. They said, we're going to go to Germany. So we went to Stuttgart. And Stuttgart was an American song. And um, one day, somebody came in. They said, he said he came from friends. And friends already had the mail, post office working. If I'll write a letter to somebody, wherever I want to, he'll mail it for me. So I wrote a letter to my uncle in Charleston. And uh, he started working on it. And we came here. And that's how you came to Charleston? And that's how I came to Charleston. How many, what, what uh, year did you come? 47. Four. What did you do when you got to Charleston? When I came to Charleston, my brother was 11 years old. In a year, he became bar mitzvah. I worked, my uncle had a music store. Who did you live with? I lived with my aunt and uncle for about six or seven months. And then they, were, uh, they rented an apartment. And I started working. I, I, my brother went to school, and I went to private lessons. And then I started working in the store. But I was in the country about six, about for eight months. And I started working in the store. And I worked there till I got married. You met that your was 47. And I got married in 53. You met your husband in Charleston? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many children do you have? I have three. We educated the children. They're all professionals. I have 
two, uh, two children married. I have two grandchildren. I the love of my life. And um, life sem seems to straighten itself out. Not always, and I never forget, and I always, always think about it. How did you adjust to living in, a, in the United States in Charleston? Did you find it difficult? Yes. I tell you what, what difficult. Um, like in Charleston, there are people who came to the United States like right after World War I. And they thought that Poland or any other country they came from is still like it was when they left. And it's not so. We d maybe didn't have at the time like washing machine and dryers and dishwashers, and, but at the time they didn't have that much of it here either. One lady took me sun uh, on the evening for a walk and was showing me the neon lights. I saw me and Liza Paul was reading some books, and uh, I don't even remember who the po who the writer was, and uh, said, "Oh, this was written in Polish too." I said, "No, it wasn't written in Polish. It was translated to Polish." I think it was Pearl Buck. Yeah, the Good Earth at the time was very popular. He says, "You read that." You didn't read English. I said, they write books in different languages, too. And uh, we came, when we came to the States, we were different than the people who came after World War I. Because people here were different then, too. Can we go back for just a minute to um, when you were growing up? Mm -hmm. uh, about how many Jews lived in your little town? Do you, would you have any idea? No, I, I really don't. But it was a nice Jewish, kind of, you know, nice Jewish place. Did many of them survive that you know of? Many come yeah, back? Yeah, I'm in touch with them. I, they have an organization. We meet almost once, or the, once a year or twice a year. They're here in the United States? In the United States. How many are in the organization? I'm not that much in touch with them because it's mostly New York. Now they switched to Miami because a lot of them moved to Miami. Um, I don't know. There's some people that remember me, but I don't remember them. I just know the people that I, you know, that I grew up with, and I'm having a time in my life when I when I see them. I saw them two years ago. This year they didn't have it on account of the war. But I was in, Florida, in Miami two years ago and met with them. And I have some very good friends that I'm in touch in Washington and in New York. Two of my children live in Washington. So as a matter of fact, I'm going there next week. You have brought some pictures with, uh, with you. Would you yes. like to show me some of them? Sure. <laughs> These are my parents. I showed you a picture of my brother, didn't I? Yeah, I showed it before. You told me what your father did, and I've forgotten. What did your father do before the war? A certified public accountant. This is a picture of that uh, organization that was feeding the poor children. That was in the ghetto? That was in the ghetto, yeah. This is my brother, the one I lost. And this is the one where we worked digging ditches. I don't know what the ditches were for. That was in one of the With camps? That. Yes. And this was very beginning of the ghetto when we could still be around. 
and we were young and did many of we those tried to forget in that group in this group I think three this one one two three five out of this one how did you get these pictures did you have a camera before in the camp? In the camp? That's not in camp. Oh, those were in the those ghetto. Those were before, yeah, that those was in the ghetto. Those were in the ghetto. No, I don't have any pictures from the camp. No. But those oh, this one here, the first one, that was just, you know, went to work and came back. And uh, I don't even remember what That was it. when you were living at home. I'll, yeah, I was living at home first. Uh, no, we were lucky if we had bread in, bread in the camp. <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to tell us? Do you, do you think about the experience often? I do, and a lot, of <laughs> a lot of times when I think about it, it seems like, a, like I dreamt, like it never happened. Because I was, I was always telling my mother and Kim that she didn't bring me up right. I wasn't... I was a sp like I said I was spoiled and but I should she should have brought me up tougher and she said she didn't know that was going to happen and um she was really the one that kept kept my morale cuz I, I kept saying that I I just I really didn't want to live the humiliation, how they acted, the food, watching the people, people that you knew all your life, and you really didn't know them, because the circumstances bring out in a person certain things that you would never know about them. Hunger in Hunger, I think, was one of the, and the, the humanization. You were not human. They made that, they made, they made something out of you, like they should step on you and smash you, but you were nothing. I, I used to work. I had a very precision job. This is really what was one of the things that saved me. I was not a very strong person. I mean, physically. And uh, if I had to work 14, 15 hours, or in the places where the people turned yellow because they were working in a factory where they made the gas, and I, c I wouldn't have lived through it. But they picked me to a job, I was very lucky that you had to be, have a lot of education before to do it. It was very precision and you couldn't work more than eight hours a day. And normally everybody worked, you know, 14, 16, whatever you could get out of it. I worked from seven o'clock in the morning till three o'clock. Then the other shift was from three to 11, and there was a third shift from 11 to 7. They used to change around. And um, I think that's what kept me alive. And what did you do from 3 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Did you have to do anything else in the camp? You had to sleep. Mm, no. <laughs> you had to sleep. You were hungry. <laughs> uh, you had to wash your hair. You didn't have any hot water, so you wash your hair with what they called coffee. You washed it because if your hair were not clean, they cut cut your hair off. You had to come out uh, when you went seven o'clock to work. You didn't, didn't get, go out seven o'clock. You went out over five o'clock because they had to keep on counting and counting and counting. Then one was in the bathroom and it was, she wasn't there. You had to count again. You could stay in the snow for hours if one person was missing. 
you had to clean your barracks. What you didn't it? have to make beds because you didn't sleep in bed. They have like bank beds, but like it wasn't. I guess call it bank beds. Three rows of boards. That's why I would never have my children beg for bank bed when they were little. I would never have a bank bed in my house. What was the food like? What did they serve you? You had coffee made out of, I don't know what it was made of, but it was warm. And if you want to wash your hair, you didn't drink the coffee, you had to save the coffee. Then you had the soup. You know, I, if I walk into a house and the cook turn up, I wouldn't walk in there. I'll turn right around and leave. Because they used to give us some dry turnip and cooked in water. And then a slice of bread, which people were killing each other for a slice of bread. Because they gave a slice of bread, a small loaf of bread, let's say, to 10 people. How can you slice 10 slices? Exactly, and I mean exactly to the crumb alike. And maybe once a week, a little pot of margarine. That was it. That was at lunch and at that, that was lunch, dinner, and breakfast. <laughs> All three meals were the same. Oh, yeah. And so I think, br I don't remember, I think bread was only once a day, soup twice a day. So, was now. I remember my mother saved some of her soup for me when I was on night shift to come back, and somebody got hold of it and come back, and I was hungry, like I don't know what, had nothing. You said before that people that you knew acted in ways that you would never have expected. Could you describe that a little bit? Well, when it comes to survival, there are no rules. Those were people who, parents with children, I mean grown children, because there were no small children except my dad. There's some there was some instinct in the people to survive, and that they'll do anything to survive. There were no, there was no line that they wouldn't cross to survive. Like what? Like steal somebody's food. I I saw things that I would never say because I I don't want people who are involved in it, that some of the people are living here and know about it. Some of them, those people were nice people, intelligent people, people who loved you. But when it came to food, or a piece of, st even a piece of straw, or a piece of rug that you covered yourself with. Or when. And I, n when I think back now, I can understand it. Because everybody wanted to live. We didn't, we didn't think we'll ever. I never thought that I'll ever, ever live through it. How did the guards in the camp treat you? The German guards? Mm -hmm. We have one man who was watching us at, at night where we were working, and he was like an incl enclosed glass office and watching us. That one man, there were four of us working at one table. 
sometimes brought us four little sandwiches. The German eat sandwiches at that then. And he was a f he didn't want to be caught either. He wasn't allowed to do that either. He left it at the end of the table, and then he was sitting in the office watching if we divided it. But people like this, you could count on the fingers. There was a woman there, she and her husband, that was, <laughs> she wouldn't do it. She was going around and hitting people, be beating people. There were, two, there, there were some, some of them but have a little human blood in it, but very, very few. Was there much physical abuse? Yes, I was beaten, but I didn't cry. I cried later, but not then. See, was there a great deal of fear? Fear? Harm. The only time we were happy is where we had to go into shelter when they were bombing. That's where we were singing. <laughs> they were petrified, but we had nothing to lose. Anything dead, anything could be better, better what we had than what we really had. You said you used the coffee to wash your hair. Where did you bathe, and where did you use bathroom facilities? Bathroom facilities had a, a long, very long building, and it had a floor, and it had maybe 40, 50 holes in the floor. At night, you couldn't get out. they'll shoot you. But those were the bathroom facilities. Now, in one camp, we had a washroom. And we didn't bathe there. We just could brush your teeth and wash your face and wash around. They took us to, to a shower, I think, once a month. And if you got sick, that was another trouble. I got typhoid fever. But I was afraid to go to the hospital because in the hospital they used to come in and kill you. So I was going to work with it the whole time. It was very high fever. Luckily, I survived. So you never saw a doctor? No, I wasn't going to go to the hospital. I've been in one time. And I was there, I think, two days, and my mother heard that the Germans are coming to the hospital to check out. So she got me out. We were very strong. <laughs> I, was, I was very, very strong, the strongest I've ever been, I think, with my health, is in camp. But, um, what happened to your mother? You say she died uh, a few months before the war was My over. My mother got sick, and she went to the doctor, and he told her she, she needs an operation. An operation day, you know, you had no, no chin. And uh, I really don't know what it was. She was very sick on Yom Kippur, the last Yom Kippur I remember. And uh, then they put her in the hospital, and she died. In the hospital? I don't know if she died or what they did to her. I don't know. But she is mm -hmm. buried in a common grave mm -hmm. in Chesterhova. I went there when I was there. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Yom Kippur. Did, you, did the people in the camp uh, observe Yom Kippur or try to? We... Did you try um, to keep any kind of Jewishness among yourselves? Yes. Yeah. 
They didn't let us forget it. You couldn't forget it. A lot of people lost faith when they came out. A lot of them. And, um, but I didn't. I, um, you know, the Jewish religion, you don't ask questions, nobody's going to answer you. Why did it take the most, uh, the first ones to go and the, the religious rabbis and uh, the religious Jews, they were the first ones to go. Or children, what did children ever do? What did I do? I was born Jewish, but that's all I did. I didn't do anything wrong to anybody. But, um, I don't know. When, the, when the, my mother died, one of the Germans told me I could go with him on the truck with the body to the cemetery. So on this picture, this picture I had with me, yeah, this is the picture of my parents. Mm -hmm. But on the back of the picture, when I came to the cemetery, I counted the steps from the gate if I ever wanted to go back so I can find the grave. But when I went back, it's, it was written with a pencil, you can't read it. Uh, instead of 196 steps, I made 96 steps and couldn't find a place. So finally the God guide asked me what I'm looking for and I told him. So he took me to the common grave that they buried all of them from the camp over there because they had no crematorium over there in Chester Hall, so they buried them. You went back? I went back. I was, we were in Poland three years ago. And you I went took back my children. Where did you go when you went back? First, we went to Auschwitz and to Birkenau. Then we went to, I didn't go to the camp that I was in. I didn't want to go. But I went to the cemetery over there. And it was very hard to get in because it was a restricted area. They had some kind of factory there. But, and we had to give up our passports, which I didn't like, to be able to go in. And, and we got there. Were there any monuments or anything? Monument? No. No indication. There are some old I mean, monuments. Any indication? No. You know, some of it, most of the cemeteries in Poland are kept up by an American committee. There's a committee that does it. Because we went to my husband's hometown and their cemetery is kept up. And my hometown is kept up too. Did you go back to your house? The town? There was no lived? house. The house that we lived before was torn down and there was another building in it and the house we stayed in the ghetto my grandparents house I couldn't find it I knew the number but I changed numbers and there was like a the house and and at here and it was like a small alley going down there the building between and I had sprained my ankle that morning I went to the Warsaw ghetto uh, to the memorial, and I sprayed my ankle, and we had rented cars to go to the town. And by the time I got there, my leg was like that. So I couldn't walk that much. We want to go back. Mm -hmm. We want to go back to the place where my father was killed. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell us that you can think of? No, I just hope that it should never, ever happen again because it's impossible to describe it. I, I myself can describe it. I myself don't believe it that I went through it. And uh, I get very upset with the stories that, that never happened. The Jews made it up. There were Americans who liberated, the Americans who saw it, what happened to them. 
They made it up too. Just pray to God that never, ever, never, I don't care where and when or with what people, that things like this should never be allowed to happen. Thank you very much.